Welcome back to Kalusuga Nai Karapatan. Good day to our viewers. We've been on hiatus lately, but we're certainly resuming our program to give you more information about your health rights. Yes, Dr. Lily. We miss them and hopefully they also miss us, our dear viewers. Good day to our viewers and to you, Dr. Lily. Our episode today is about the universal health care law and how our citizens can freely access this service. Good day to my Chancellor co-host, Dr. Carmen Sita Padilla. We have another exciting episode today. In fact, a reason and a time for us Filipinos to celebrate the universal health care law. This UHC law automatically enrolls all Filipino citizens in the National Health Insurance Program. It prescribes complementary reforms in the health system, such as expanding the health coverage of Philippine health members. They can now avail of free medical consultations and laboratory tests. UHC is called a landmark law because it introduces major reforms, especially in the area of financing health care needs, ensuring that even the financially challenged can access the much-needed health services and expensive but life-saving medicine. This law is really relevant and useful. We know that health care in the Philippines is dependent on your financial capacity. It ranges from excellent quality if you have the money to dire or poor quality if you do not have the resources. You can see the economic divide. Hospitals in the major urban cities are of a high or excellent standard, while many in rural areas have substandard service and sorely lacking in infrastructure. So there is hope in this law that even if you are poor, you may be given first-rate health service. So how can Juan de la Cruz access the UHC service? I think we have distinguished resource persons to help us answer this question. It is about time Chancellor Menchit that we introduce them. Would you like to do the honors? Oh yes, Dr. Lili. So may I start with the Chief of Staff and Undersecretary of Health Regulation Team at the Department of Health. And concurrently, he is also officer in charge of the Food and Drug Administration. He is a graduate of the Intermed program of the UP College of Medicine and obtained his residency in ophthalmology at the Philippine General Hospital and fellowship in ophthalmic pathology and oncology at the University of Valladolid, Spain. He finished a Master of Science in Clinical Epidemiology and has a diploma in inter International Public Health at Institute of Salud Carlos III, Escuela Nacional de Sanidad, Madrid, Spain. Concurrently, concurrently, he's an Associate Professor of the College of Medicine, University of the Philippines, Manila. He served as Director of the Philippine General Hospital, City Councilor of San Fernando, Pampanga, and Country Coordinator for the Philippines at the World Health Organization, LCF, LCIF, Prevention of Blindness in Children Project. He was involved in the crafting and implementation of health policy from the municipal level to the national legislation to the first ever global health treaty ratified by WHO member countries. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Rolando Enrique Domingo. Dr. Eric. Hi, Ma'am Menchi. Hi, Ma'am Lili. I'm very happy to be here. We have another illustrious resource person a professor at the University of the Philippines College of Medicine and an academician of our country's National Academy of Science and Technology. He graduated from the UP College of Medicine and pursued residency on in internal medicine at the Philippine General Hospital, specializing in cardiology. He also obtained a Master's Science in Clinical Epidemiology at McMaster University, Ontario, Canada. Our resource speaker practices internal medicine at the Philippine General Hospital. His research and publications range from clinical trials on Nobel drugs for primary and secondary prevention to epidemiologic studies on the burden of illness and causes of cardiovascular disease. He's one of the advocates who lobbied for stronger tobacco control 
through increase in excise tax on tobacco. His research on Philippine studies on primary care will give major insights into the implementation of the universal health care. Dear viewers, let us welcome Dr. Antonio Danz. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting us here. Okay. So let's, let's start the, um, the, shoot the first question, uh, Yusek Eric. Uh, can you tell us the, um, the components of the universal health care law? Well, when we say universal health care, it means, first of all, all Filipinos by virtue of birth are members of the National Health Insurance Program, whether you're contributing or indirectly being paid for by other sources. It also means that all resources for health will be pooled in one big fund. So, hindi na po kailangan humingi ang mga tao sa kung kanikanino para sa mga pangangailangan nila. We want to make sure that everybody will be assigned to a primary care physician and that everybody has access to quality care enough to make them better without exposing them to financial hardship. Yun po bang tuwing may magkakasakit, hindi kailangan maghirap ang bawat Pilipino. So the law has been signed, but have we started on the uh, crafting of the implementing rules and regulations? Yes, we're doing the IRR now and it will probably be out by August or September this year, which means we're going to have early implementation towards the last quarter of the year and then early 2020. Um, when you say uh, implementation, are we talking about a national implementation or is it going to be by stages? Yeah, it will probably take quite a few years before it's uh, implemented nationally, but we have advanced implementation sites. We have already identified provinces and cities that, are, that have systems that are ready to go. So we're probably starting with about 30, 31 uh, advanced implementation sites starting end of the year and 2020. And the implementation sites have been identified? Yes, they have already been identified and we've been doing groundwork already in these areas. So we've been coordinating with the local government units, the governors and the mayors, and trying to set up that system that will be ready for it by, by like, like towards the end of the year. So how do you qualify as an advanced implementation okay. site? So a pre-selection was made. Uh, we had to look at the... LGUs that had this, we had this interlocal health zones uh, program that has been being done by the Department of Health from years back. And then we're looking at the readiness of that, you know, of that area, the presence, for example, of primary care facilities, of secondary and tertiary hospitals, and of course, willingness no, of the local chief ex executives to join us. When we look at the total picture, how many sites are we talking about? And when you say third implementation sites, what's the percentage of that number in the total picture? Oh, that will be about less than 20% of the total picture. So we, we see this as happening in the next 5 to 10 years to cover the whole country. 5 to 10 years. Okay, but you intend to start towards the end of this year. Once the IRR is finally approved and implementable. And you're talking about being accessed by everybody, no? so uh, can you give us a, some information on how the poor can access uh, uh, universal health care in the advanced implementation sites? How, how is it going to work? Paano yeah, ba yung music, Eric? Bawat po kasi Pilipino, magkakaroon ka ng assigned ka sa isang primary care uh, practitioner. It can be a doctor, maybe a team of uh, health, uh, health uh, professionals that might be a nurse, you know, a midwife, but you have somebody to go to for your daily needs. Now, kung meron kang sakit, kung may nararamdaman, dito tayo magpapatingin. And this will help you navigate the health system. Kung kailangan pumunta sa ospital, kung kailangan dalhin sa ibang mas specialized centers, ito, yung, ito pa rin ang point of access natin at matutulungan natin ikaw na pumunta kung saan yung level of care na iyong kinakailangan. I understand, Dr. Eric, that a primary care provider is needed to implement this law. Who will qualify again, please? Well, uh, there's going to be a set of standards that we're going to put up. No? So, magkakaroon tayo ng pamantayan kung sino yung primary care physician. It could be a doctor who's practicing now, uh, who might be a specialist but might have to get extra training. It could be a fresh graduate who will have to undergo a module no? training and then take a qualifying ano, exam. And then the person will be certified as a primary care practitioner. So, uh, Dr. Tony, so you're an internist, no? you're a cardiologist. So my question now is, um, can you qualify as a primary care for provider? Yeah, so kailangan, one thing we want to achieve in the future 
is to make primary care a specialty. So, para lang maintindihan ng nakikinig, ano ba yung primary care? Apat ho ang tungkulin ng primary care. Siya yung first contact, unang pupuntahan. Pag meron kang naramdaman. So, pag may naramdaman ka, hindi na kapitbahay ang tatanong mo. Meron ka ng pupuntahan. Second, comprehensive care. Uh, so, hindi yung may doktor ka sa mata, may doktor ka sa tenga, sa puso, sa bituka, sa bibig. So, one doctor to see most of all your illnesses or one provider, not necessarily a doctor. So, first contact, comprehensive, tapos coordinator siya. No? Alam niya kung kailangan kang ma-admit, matingnan ng specialist, no? kailangan mo ng gamot or test. So, in, not too late, not too early rin yung healthcare mo. And not too much and not, not too little naman. Tama lang. No? And then the last obligation ng primary care is yung principal point of continuing care. Alam nyo, hindi natin naiisip. Pag na-bypass ka, ngwari taga-tawi-tawi ka, na-bypass ka sa heart center, uuwi ka rin, di ba? Sinong mag-aalaga sa iyo pag uwi mo? Yung primary care. Pag na-stroke ka, uuwi ka rin. Uh, so, someone has to take care of you where you live. Hindi naman pwedeng lilipat ka na sa East Avenue dahil na-bypass ka. So, first contact, comprehensive, coordinating care, coordinated care, and principal point of continuing care. So, sino bang gagampan ng tungkulin niyan? Sa current workforce, ang primary care ng maraming tao, meron na tayong, yung iba, meron, marami, wala pa. Alam, 66% of Filipinos die without seeing any healthcare provider. So, yung mga meron na, dapat wag na nating galawin yon Trusted na nila yun eh, yung primary care provider nila. Pero we need to build that workforce in the future. So, ang tanong mo, pwede ba akong maging primary care cardiologist ako eh? Eh, alam mo kung magiging strict tayo and insist natin na specialist ka agad in primary care, uh, like in the UK, merong primary care specialist. Sa Australia, may primary care specialist. But we can't do that right away. Right now, everyone has to help in primary care. So whether you're a cardiologist, lung specialist, family physician, or GP, we even need the help of the nurses and the midwives. No? And in many areas, we will need the help of the barangay health workers to provide primary care. Uh, ang responsibility natin is to provide training for them to understand that primary care is an important component of healthcare, of the healthcare system. So, so ang sinasabi mo, it's going to be a teamwork. It's okay. going to be teamwork. Um, Oo. But, pero kung pakikinggan ko yung sinabi ni Yusik Eric na, well, okay, there will be training for all levels. There has to be a standard, a set of standards, cutting across from Batanes to Tawi-Tawi. Pero pag sinabi natin may set of standards, uh, it will be something that is that can be achieved by either a nurse or a physician. Am I am I correct? Uh, of course, uh, but not necessarily a barangay health worker. The barangay health worker will be a, a team player. Yes. Tama Support. Yes. Oh, Support yes. yun. So, so this is achievable. Actually, pwede, pwede natin rin. ibahin yung tingin natin sa mga barangay health worker. Pero kasi kung may exam ka, so I'm just looking at that angle wherein there will be training and then there will be an exam. But of course, you know, when I look at that set of standards, uh, pwede tayo mag-level off siguro between the nurses and the physician uh, because uh, they, meron silang kinuhang courses talaga during their... Yes, 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 yes. But I see the everybody else around them as a partner, as a, yes, a midwife, pwede pa siguro mag-level off. Kaya alam, alam mo, we have areas where there's neither a doctor, nurse, or a midwife. In, in the U.S., they have the so-called uh, physician's assistants. These are not doctors. They're lay people who trained one or two years in, in medicine. And they're allowed to see patients and give medications. But there's a requirement. They have to live within a certain distance from a primary care provider. No, so, kunwari, I, I'm not sure. I think 10 miles, you should, there should be a primary care provider whom you can consult. Uh, and they're authorized. No? So, community health workers in China are allowed to see patients. So, dito, 
if we provide training for our community workers, for lay people, they can actually augment our primary care workforce. Ang problema, we give them obligations now. BHW ka, tungkulin mo to. But we don't give them enough training. We need to professionalize our community health workers and make sure that when we assign them something, they are well prepared to render those functions. I want to throw the question to, to you, Sik Eric. I mean, is this the big picture when you say that you're looking for the primary care provider? Uh, uh, you talked about, because earlier you talked about uh, the different professions who can come yeah. on board. It's, it can be one person, a uh, physician, or it can be a team. Uh, I think that's what we're going with the IRR. You need a licensed professional to be a part of the team, a nurse at least probably, or a midwife. But you can have, if one person does not all have all the competencies no, that in the set standards, then you can have members of the team who can complement. So, pwede pong isang tao, pwede ring mga grupo, but, you know, a team can be working up to the level, of course, of the community health workers. Okay. So, in the upcoming advanced implementation sites, is this going to be the setup? Yes. Uh, well, no, the advanced implementation sites are really more prepared. Eh. So, these are, you know, provinces or cities which probably have a tertiary hospital, a few secondary hospitals and uh, rural health units or barangay health centers in most of the barangays. So, in the advanced Parang sinasabi natin, sites, kompleto na yung ating... Medyo ano? may kompleto na yung recipe, no? Medyo may reseta na tayo na nandiyan na. So, uh, it's not going to be as difficult in the advanced implementation sites as in the sites later, probably, especially the more isolated and the disadvantaged areas. So, when will we start, when will we start going into the more difficult areas? Well, immediately, no? uh, not as quickly, of course, as the advanced implementation sites, but the law also very clearly says that you have to have preference, preferential treatment for the geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas. Because these are the areas that actually do not have healthcare access right now. So, at the same time that we're doing the advanced implementation areas, we're also preparing the GIDA areas already. Actually, some of the advanced implementation sites have isolated areas. Ah, okay. diba? So, okay. makikinabang na yung ibang yeah. areas na to sa... By being advanced implementation sites, we can address the problems in those areas. For example, Sorsogon will be an advanced implementation site. And they have some uh, municipalities with barangays uh, that are remote and disadvantaged. So, yung mag so advanced implementation sites have a mix of the... Um, uh, the urban, the rural, yes. and the uh, the Jida area. So, because but you one, get... yeah, the provinces usually have. You know, most provinces in the Philippines still have, you know, geographically isolated areas or barangays that are really cut off from the rest of the province or the big cities. So, these areas are also included when we do the advanced implementation. You know, earlier you said that uh, we're looking at the full implementation in five to ten years, and. Um, so what do you see as the, the major concerns, the major challenges in uh, uh, going forward in implementing it 100%? I'll start off with uh, uh, Yusek Eric. Well, the main challenge is infrastructure. Uh, we know, for example, that we have 40,000 barangays and communities in the Philippines, and about half of them, only half of them, have a, a barangay health station. Right? So, in some areas, you can probably tap private clinics and make them part of the primary care, but there are areas with none, so we have to build those. And the human resources. Uh, we know that we sorely lack uh, human resources, especially in the far-flung areas. We do have a lot of doctors and nurses, but they're concentrated here in the big cities. So have distributing them and having, have, you know, making sure that we have primary care practitioners in all 40,000 communities in the Philippines, that's going to be a big challenge. Doc Eric, health is a matter of right. And uh, I got sick with it recently, for example, and the local government unit health center is not in accordance to your classification, not yet ready mm -hmm. to practice primary care. If it is a matter of pride, how can I avail of this universal health care law? 
Well, once it's fully running, uh, all community centers, all primary care centers should uh, reach that certain level of standard. We have a menu of the services that they should be able to give and the quality level that they're able to deliver it. So what we really want is to everybody, for everybody to have uniform access to uniform quality healthcare without, you know, without spending money out of pocket and without going into debt just because you want to get better. So that's the dream. No? Everybody should be able to go somewhere near. We all know that care is better, cheaper, and has best outcomes if it's closer to you and more generalized and more continuous. So that's the goal of primary care. We want it there in your community at a good enough quality for you to be better after you seek care at that center. Uh, Dr. Eric, may I pursue my question? Considering the current uh, health care service delivery system, we know very well that different local government units have different levels of readiness. Some big cities or mega cities would have more resources and perhaps would be readily uh, be able to respond to the requisites to comply with the universal health care law. What would happen to local government units with less resources with similar problems? How will the uh, universal health care law be able to give this uh, privilege to have easy access to, to be diagnosed and be managed by the primary care uh, team? So that's where the national government comes in. We have to give preferential assistance to those that need more help. We want, for example, to help deploy our health human resources and develop human resources from that area, give them scholarships, and in return they will serve in that area, and build you know, some facilities that are needed in those areas where they, they are sorely lacking. Uh, we understand that you know we have even provinces or cities have different levels of economic development and of uh, infrastructure, but the government will have to step in and try to help to equalize that. But not only the infrastructure, but also the human resources. So if health is a matter of right, Dr. Dance, and uh, I understand it is our right, but cannot be absolutely be asserted. So is there such a thing as shared responsibility here to make it successful? Well, yes. So, nakakatuwa itong universal healthcare law kasi we're now going to expand our coverage. And, you know, it's healthcare regardless of ability to pay. Dati, binabayaran lang pag na-hospitalize ka, no? pag malapit ka nang mamatay. Pero yung sakit that led to your hospitalization, hindi natin binabayaran. No? O pag uwi mo, kailangan mong gamot to Home prevent care. recurrence. Yeah. Hindi yan covered dati. Now it will be covered. That's one of the main things in the universal healthcare law. So yung karapatan natin, uh, mas ano na, mas inaalagaan na because of that law. Pero we also have to remember na meron din tayong tungkulin. No? We, we have a role to make it successful. At isang nahihirapan kaming explain doon sa aming study sites, itong concept of risk sharing. Kailangan itong pool of funds from PhilHealth. No? Isipin natin, or yung pool of funds na bibigay sa province nyo, sa advanced implementation sites. Atin lahat yan, ambagan tayo dyan. No? We should not look at it and say, Uy, may pera ako dyan. I have 2,000 pesos of healthcare. Pupunta ako dun ngayon. And uh, I want a urinalysis and my cholesterol and all my tests done. No? And bigyan nyo na ako ng antibiotics in case magkasakit ako. This year, magagamit ko na at saka paracetamol. Hindi po ganun. Dapat, dahil ang bagan niyan, ang bagan, isipin natin na okay lang na hindi ako magkasakit ngayong taon na to. Okay lang na hindi ko magamit yung pera na para sa akin. Kasi kung hindi ako nagkasakit, una, dapat masaya ka, hindi ka nagkasakit eh. Pangalawa, yung pera na gagamitin sana sa iyo, 
pwedeng gamitin sa ibang tao. Next year, baka ikaw na yun eh. No? So, ambagan tayo, let's share the risk. Huwag natin abusuhin na pupunta tayo doon lahat and we will demand no, yung funds na para sa atin. We need to think. Ambagan tayo, let's share that fund. Let's stay healthy and let's take good care of it. Huwag natin abusuhin. Alam mo, napakaganda niyan, Dr. Tony. Pero ang, when you talk about uh, funding from promotion to preventive to uh, diagnostic hanggang uh, uh, treatment, do we have the money for that? So, ay, ay, pwede natin pag-usapan siguro kung saan ba natin kukunin ngayon yung pera nito because you're talking about 110 Filipinos who probably... Million. Uh, million. Uh -huh. Million. We'll need this kind of uh, share. So, uh, Dr. Eric, do we have... Are we ready for the funds? Yeah. Well, when we say universal health care, of course, hindi dapat isipin na lahat ng kailangan natin maibibigay ng gobyerno sa lahat ng panahon. For example, there will be some illnesses that are catastrophic and maybe we might have to help. No, We might have to have some out-of-pocket expenses. But for most cases, for most common illnesses, and with the most basic no, basic accommodations and the most basic amenities in a hospital, we want to be able to give that out-of-pocket. Uh, ang ibig ko po sabihin, kapag merong nagkasakit at nagpa-admit siya sa hospital, kung doon siya sa ward, na maka-anim sila na tao sa isang kwarto, walang aircon naman, pero lahat ng gamot na kakailanganin mo ay may bibigay sa'yo, maaari kang walang gagasto sa'yo na ilalabas na pera. But if you want, for example, a room with a private, ano, with a television and air condition or a suite, then you might have to shell out a little more money. No? But what we want to give is to be able to give the basic service, good quality service, with the least amenities, without out-of-pocket expenses. Okay. Maganda yun, ha? Yeah. Basic services. Okay? It's para malino lang, no? Kasi parang yung mga nakikinig natin, kala natin, you know, you can just take in any any room, no? But you're saying is that your responsibility is to make sure that the basic services are actually provided. Pero ang tanong ko ngayon, yung sources of, uh, um, kung saan pa, saan pa manggagaling yung pera, you... Okay. Yun kasing ayaw natin. Yung nangyayari ngayon, uh, I'm, most people, especially sa provinces, the poor ones would re, ano, no? this is a common experience. You get out of the hospital, you get the bill, babawas yung field health, tapos lalapit ka sa congressman mo, sa mayor mo, hingi ka sa PCSO, hanggang makauwi ka. Parang namamalimos ang Pilipino. So ito yung gusto natin i-avoid. So all of those funds will be pulled. Magkakasama na po yung pera sa PhilHealth, yung galing sa tobacco tax, sa syntaxes natin, sa PCSO, sa PAGCOR, sa isang pooled ano na lang, fund. So that every time we get uh, sick, as long as we are in the basic ano, no, basic accommodations, we would call them, lahat po ng pool na yun, ng pera, doon nang gagamitin pambayad. Pero hindi na tayo kailangang umikot, hindi na kawawa yung Pilipino. At kakayanin natin. Kakayanin natin for the most basic, ano, for basic services and basic accommodations. So, looks like, now may I ask Dr. Eric, given the 100 million Filipinos and uh, approximately how much are we talking about in terms of implementation of the universal health care, how many billions are we talking about? to have full access to universal health care given the so many millions of Filipinos. How much do we need? Well, our budget for the first year is about 257 billion. 257 and this incrementally grows to the next 10 years so that we're able to cover the gaps, especially the, the infrastructure that we need to build. And of course, to increase the packages, not the benefit packages in underfield health. And the incremental increase is uh, dependable on the Filipinos' population growth rate. Yes, and inflation and expanding, you know, we want expanding benefits. Now We want to start probably with the most basic benefits, but to expand them little by little, especially to include, to expand the outpatient packages that people should seek you know, on a regular basis. So my, my question to Dr. Tony Dance, who is a researcher cardiologist, looking at the population pyramid of the Filipinos and who would be what what in the population pyramid would have 
the most need for this uh, universal health care, would it be geriatric care, pediatric care, maternal and child health care, chronic diseases, infectious diseases, in terms of your forecasting, yeah. uh, well, Dr. Dan. Right now, half of the population is above 20, and about half of us are below 20. So I'd say, medyo balanced naman yung pediatric and elderly. But I think what we need to concentrate on now is the type of diseases that we'll, we will see. And, you know, because of development, uh, we are dying less and less of pneumonia mm -hmm. and diarrhea so it's more chronic. and tuberculosis. Lifestyle. So we're getting older, diba? Lifestyle we, diseases. Yes, so now we need to look at chronic illnesses. Kasi our system is ill-prepared for chronic illnesses. Yes. When our health system was developed in the 50s, ang talagang hinaharap natin yan, mga maternal and child yeah, infectious illness. Infectious diseases. Infectious right, diseases. Right, right. But now, since then, our lifespan has increased by more than, by around 10 years. And so now we need to look at people with chronic diseases of aging, of related to lifestyle, yes, yes. that need medication. Na, hindi na one week lang na medication. It's now lifelong medication pag may hypertension ka. So we need to prepare our workforce to handle that. Our, our midwives and nurses, uh, need to, we need to enhance their training so that they are now capable not just of infectious, maternal and child care, but they're now ready to manage chronic diseases in, the, in adults and in the elderly population. So the Department of Health agenda would be able to really lay down the focus of this universal health care and I understand the health agenda of the OH is also focusing on lifestyle diseases, geriatric care, right? Yes, you know, you know, we still have that double burden. You know, we have TB and we have the, uh, the infectious diseases, but really the NCDs, the non-communicable diseases. This is the future. Now it's diabetes and hypertension and heart disease and cancer, and this is what we have to prepare for. The thing is, you know, our population is going to get older much faster than the other countries did, you know. Uh, they had the time to prepare. You know? they, they, their, their longevity of their people grew in a, lo a longer span of time. But the countries now are getting older faster. And like I think like Tony said, you know, the, our health system is not prepared for that. We're still prepared ready for a young population. But we have to get ready to take care of the older population in the next 10 to 20 years. And it's something that we have to forecast. Actually, um, uh, Dr. Lili, sabi nila, in about 10 years, the, the geriatric age will almost double. And we have to prepare for that one. Am I right? Uh, yes. And, and are we preparing for that one? We, right now, we have one or two geriatric centers, for example, in the whole Department of Health System. But we have to start replicating this in all regions and at least in all, in probably in all provinces very soon. So we were, we, we can foresee that it will happen, that, but we have to actively prepare for it. Um, some, you, you were mentioning something about population-based and individual-based uh, services. Can you expand on, on that yeah. part? Because well, health insurance is supposed to take care of individual-based needs. Mm -hmm. For example, I need, I have a, a pneumonia then PhilHealth will pay for my antibiotics. But there are ways to prevent me from getting pneumonia, which are population-based. Making sure, for example, that the, the environment is clean. Prevent diarrhea by making sure the water for everybody is safe and clean. And these are population-based measures to help improve the health condition of the people. And they should be taken care of by other government agencies, like the local government units, for example, or the ENR, and the other departments. So we have both population-based and individual-based uh, care. No? So yung individual-based, this goes to feel health. But we should not forego the population-based uh, measures that have to be taken care of by other agencies too. So, meron na ba tayong mga agencies that are focusing on that one? Yung titong advanced implementation sites natin, can we give an example to our viewers on uh, an area wherein they've covered not only the health, but also this population-based service? May example ka bang naiisip, Tony? Because well, I think a lot, eh. a lot of the population-based services are, are already ongoing. 
No? And, and the, I think the LGUs and the DOH and all the other departments mm -hmm. are, are equipped to do that. Mm -hmm. Pero, if I understand it right, Eric, you need to correct me on this. All the, all the funds from, that are given to the special health fund for an LGU, mm -hmm. sometimes there will be savings. Okay. No? Uh, and then I think savings are important. Uh, hindi pwedeng ano yan, uh, masyadong said, no? Uh, the LGUs need a profit margin. That's one of the basic requirements for uh, capitation and global payments to work. There, there should be some profit margin. And the law provides, and you have to correct me on this if I'm wrong, that that profit margin, some of it can go to population-based measures as the LGU sees appropriate. So, as, it as can an example, for problems. example, Bataan, no? Bataan, the province, is one of our uh, early implementation sites. And they have a very, very strong program uh, against tobacco. So they do a lot of, they spend a lot of money on health promotion, and they have very strong legislation against smoking, against selling to, uh, cigarettes in front of schools, and yeah, they have people going around and making sure that nobody's smoking in public areas. So this part is taken care of. It's going to prevent a lot of disease. It's going to uh, stop a lot of children from starting that uh, habit. And you know, it, in the end, it will help uh, conserve resources for our individual-based care. So you can see there are a lot of very creative and very good local government executives. No? And we just have to help support them on that. Maganda ito, no? Kasi ang sinasabi natin, pag sinabi natin universal health care, we're not just looking at field health, no? We have this perception that uh, uh, we're talking only about maraming misconceptions na, na hospital-based, kailangan lang field health. What we're saying now is that it has to be a coordinated effort from all sectors, no? Uh, the funding component, just pulling the resources is one that takes care of the funding. But then engaging the local government now is a is another component that uh, we have to consider to, 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 make, to make it succeed. It won't succeed without the local government now because we, once we have those systems, it's really up to the governors and up to the city mayors to make sure that the system works. So uh, oh, it's not, uh, no, it's not uh, optional. No? The local government has to be very involved in this and we have to create that capability for the local chief executives to be able to manage the health system. If you consider, for example, the major lifestyle related, uh, the major lifestyle problems we've been addressing, smoking, alcohol use, lack of exercise, and a healthy diet. Okay. Uh, we've spent a lot of effort educating populations about this foreign, you shouldn't smoke, you shouldn't drink too much, eat healthy exercise. But no matter how much you tell people they will not change their lifestyle if we do not change the environment they live in. We, we have to enable them. For example, we tell them to exercise. Here in Manila, where will you exercise? Diba? We need open space and alternative modes of transport to motorized traffic. You tell them to eat healthy, how can they eat healthy? Uh, salads are more expensive. no? Then, then, ano, yung cup noodles, right? And we tell them to smoke. We did that. I did that for 20 years in my career and nothing worked until we increased the taxes on tobacco. Biglang, 4 million less Filipino smokers. So, and these interventions, we cannot say that they are DOH responsibilities. If you want to provide open space, kailangan kasama dyan ng LGU, ang DPWH. If you want healthy food, uh, kailangan kasama dyan ng Department of Agriculture, Trade and Industry. Ang DEX kasama dyan because food in the schools. No? Uh, so, tobacco tax, DOH will push it. Kaya lang, actually increasing tax on tobacco is the work of senators and congressmen. So, yung promotive aspects of health, we should stop thinking na trabaho yan ng DOH. Trabaho yan ng buong lipunan. 
lahat ng departments of the executive and our legislative uh, sector. This is their role to improve the health of the Filipino people. So, napakalawak ko ng scope ng ano, prom health promotion. It should not be the sole function. Uh, or it should not look at DOH as the sole implementer of uh, promotive health intervention. So, Dr. Eric, we know very well the the pack of eating unhealthy food. We know very well also, but this is the most accessible, as you have said, uh, Dr. Dunn, I myself, I, I don't like fast food. Not because it is unhealthy, but because it's quite boring already if you eat it because it's the most accessible if you are a very busy person. My, my excitement about this is introducing a new concept of practice of primary care. I think this is very brilliant and oh. developing countries like us would always need the practice of primary care and we can drum bit interest for Filipinos to have a thinking, a paradigm shift about primary care as not a specialization of practice of medicine before. So the practice of primary care for physician would now be encouraging more physicians to be involved in the preventive and the promotive care. And my last point about this primary care is for how long training should be, uh, should be done or how long will it take for the full implementation of universal health care, considering the Department of Health is just trying to do some determination of the readiness of the different uh, health system delivery in locally and nationally. Well, for primary care practitioners, for primary care providers, we're going to develop a uh, curriculum. No? Uh, we're, we're, help, uh, we're getting the help of CHED, of uh, the Philippine Regulation Commission, PRC, and the Philippine Academy of Family Physicians to create a training program. Hopefully, it's not going to be a long one, no? uh, maybe six months to a year for each uh, health professional to enroll in that and then, of course, take an exam okay. and to be a certified primary oh. care practitioner. I, I'm very happy to hear that from the point of view of Commission on Higher Education in charge of health uh, professionals. We're trying to uh, look into the possibility of making primary care as a specialization in the field of medicine. So we're trying to consider a medical education, focusing on the primary health care, looking at the universal health care as the framework, as basis to practice medicine. We recently have approved two medical schools with a strength on primary health care. One is in Davao, it's a private school it's patterned after universal health care, and uh, the Bow is so proud of this. So that's the point of view of Chad. Chad is very ready to be able to be part of this uh, primary care medical education or health service uh, approach to the application of the universal health care. Yeah, I think that's the end goal. Eh? Right now, we want to equip people and train people, but in maybe 10 years from now, it will be such a big part of the curriculum, yes. but by the time they graduate, yeah. all they medical graduates should yes. be primary care physicians already. Yeah, we, we are into that, and uh, Chad would really like to be part of the OH and uh, other agencies. We really need to be uh, comprehensive in our approach, and I think that makes it universal. Well, there are two philosophies there, I think. Yeah, one, one philosophy is let's everyone who graduates in medicine should be, you know, uh, competent primary care providers. And that provides us a short-term solution because as they graduate, uh, then we can already can ask the system, them to, yeah. pay, uh, to render primary care services. The other philosophy, though, and if you look at the experience of UK, Australia, and uh, Canada, and even the US now, the other trend is to make primary care a specialty. So you require additional training. And uh, many believe that the single most important thing that pushed primary care forward in these countries is when primary care was recognized as a specialty. 
So they're no longer the lowest rung in the yeah, ladder. It, it's, uh, they now need additional specialization. In Canada, you cannot practice right after medicine. You have to either go to a traditional organ specialty like the heart or the lungs, or you go to primary care as a specialty for additional two or three years of training. So we need a short-term goal where we provide as many primary care providers as possible now, even using the existing work workforce. And we need a long-term goal where we elevate the image of primary care because that's one of the problems now is people regard primary care, kung GP ka o internist ka o family med ka, pag tinanong mo, saan ka ba nagpatingin? Eh? Family med lang ho. Yeah, yeah. Or internist lang ho. No? Or GP lang ho. Tawag nga namin, ano eh, yung lang specialist. Yeah, Dr. <laughs> kasi Dance. laging may karugtong na lang. Yeah, no? kasi Dr. Dance, we, we cannot to... blame because the College of Medicine in the Philippines, that's the orientation. Yes. 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 Professors but, will show you the glamour of being yes. a specialist. But if you look at studies <laughs> now, yes. two um, things. When you have primary care, uh, it provides, it means better care. Not too early, not too late, not too much, not too little. Yeah. No. Uh, you need, pag, pag nag, ano ka, chest pain ka, hindi lang naman puso yan. Pwede yan sa buto, sa balat, sa laman, pwede yan sa baga, sa pwede utak. yan sa esophagus, pwede sa rin utak. psychogenic. Yeah. And the primary care people have the right attitude for that. And then if you if you if you have multiple illnesses and multiple doctors na hindi nag-uusap your medications can be conflicting already uh, or interacting and leading to adverse events the primary care with a global view who looks at your whole person not just at one part of your body provides better care and in fact a recent study shows if you have one doctor looking after your overall care you live longer. That's a 2019 publication. If you have one person in charge of your health, you live longer. Kung meron kang doktor sa kaliwang tenga at sa kanang tenga at sa bawat bahagi ng katawan mo, uh, right nose then and left nose. <laughs> you have more problems. So better quality and second at a lower cost. Right? So okay. it is more Standard, efficient. Uh, better so quality, lower we cost. need to promote the value of primary care, we need to recognize it. The government has to recognize it. Doctors, nurses, and midwives need to appreciate now we have an important role when we're in primary care. And the community needs to recognize that. So we can all say, you know, primary care is mentioned 13 times in the law. But for that to work, we need to make sure the image changes from top to bottom, that we give it the appropriate importance it, that it actually has in making sure UHC is successful. So medical education is yes. very important. Nursing yes. education, and public, public, public health. health, and public health education. I, I think we need a second episode for yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. okay. okay. But um, uh, it, it, it's, uh, we'd like to request our guests to give a, you know, a last minute, uh, your, a message. Uh, Parting message, uh, Dr. Eric? Yeah, well, you know, universal care is almost here, and we need everybody's help. Uh, this will come once in a lifetime. We have to make it work. There's no choice. And this is something that we will leave for the next generation. So we really need the support of everybody on universal health care. Uh, Dr. Yeah, Eric, so, so yes, I, I just echo that. It, it's so exciting to think that we may, our children may live in a society where healthcare is provided regardless of ability to pay. Kaya lang, there's a lot of anxiety accompanying this law, uh, and, and we need to replace that anxiety with determination. We all have to make it work. Maraming anxiety ang specialists, ang hospitals, ang private clinics, ang public facilities. They need to replace their anxiety with determination to make it work. Even the people are anxious, but they have a role understanding yung sinasabi nating ambagan and risk sharing and protecting it and not abusing it. So they have a role in making it work. And we have one thing in mind dapat, our children 
and our grandchildren should live in this world where there is health care regardless of ability to pay. So Filipinos, especially the poor, are pinning so much hope in this universal health care law. It is really good that our resource persons have clarified some issues in the implementation of this law. I hope our audience has benefited from this episode. We would like to say thank you to our resource persons, Dr. Tony, Dr. Eric, for the sharing and making us understand better the UHC law. Thank you to our viewers for joining us once more in this KK episode, Kalusuga na Karapatan. I hope you have found this episode relevant. Goodbye and mabuhay ang kalusugan ay karapatan.